Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Jackie Ina, if you're new here, welcome. As you can see by the title, today I'm gonna to be talking about brands that were popularized in the 90s that are still relevant today. Some of your faves have been around for decades. Before we do get started, I just wanna say thank you to Google Career Certificate for sponsoring a portion of today's video. First of all, let's address the obvious. Do you guys like the hair? I've been wanting to do ginger, well like orangey red for a while. And I feel like what better way than talking about a nostalgic 90s trends video than today to debut this hair. I got this wig from XOXO Virgin Hair. Thank you, shout out to a black owned business. I feel like I'm channeling my inner Tyra. That was the 2000s though, wasn't it? Damn, sorry, wrong decade. Anyway, that doesn't matter. I've been watching a YouTuber by the name of Laura Jane Atelier for a while now and her whole entire brand, baby, you want vintage? You want origin stories? You want Hollywood royalty backstories? Head to her channel, her channel's amazing. And she does these videos where she talks about like beauty products that were like invented decades ago that are still around today. So I was inspired by her channel and a video that she created previously to make the video today. I chose the 90s because I feel like the 90s is having a moment right now. And a lot of these really are products that like I had no idea had had this legacy status and had been around that long. So it kind of intrigued me to like start doing some digging. Now in this video, I will be talking about origin stories of some of these brands that we're gonna be talking about, like what inspired the creation of these products. But this is my first time doing a video like this. It may not be 100% perfect or 100% historically accurate. Cut me some slack, damn it, okay? I'm just kind of, I don't know, trying something different. Like I just thought this was really fun. It was really fun to research a lot of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about in today's video. So without further ado, I'll be, you know, doing the glam. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, before we get started, if you've made it this far, first of all, you should be subscribed. Let's talk about why you're not. Hit that subscribe button so you never miss future uploads. And I always tell you guys what candle I'm burning. I'm always burning candles while I film. It's very therapeutic and I have, hi, <laughs> I have a candle brand. Today I'm burning old money from my birthday collection from Forever Mood. Clink, clink, we just launched at Sephora and y'all, we're kind of killing it. Sephora US and Sephora Canada, get yours now. Old money smells like funnel cakes, the boardwalk. It's incredible. It's the perfect summer scent. It's also gonna be really good for fall because I know summer's on her way out. We're getting her up out of here. But it's also a really good fall candle as well. It smells so good. Some of the top notes are creamy butter, brandy liqueur, vanilla pecan, brown sugar, and cinnamon. I just, if that's not a get laid candle, I don't know what else is. Too Faced Cosmetics was a makeup brand started by Jared Blandino and Jeremy Johnson back in 1998. First thing that I'm gonna say is my hat definitely goes off to people who have launched brands before social media, like when it was like really, 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 really difficult to break into the industry because that's not easy. Too Faced was birthed as a brand that was meant to kind of shake things up a little bit. You know, this was a time where like a lot of beauty brands were really kind of rigid, were really stiff. I don't wanna drop any names, I'm not gonna say any names. But you know, makeup was very, very prestigious up until a certain point in the 90s. Until you start seeing playful brands, grungier brands like Too Faced, Urban Decay, Stila's, NARS. Too Faced was just one of the few brands at the time just felt like, look, it's just makeup, it's not that deep. Let's both Jared and Jeremy are still, even though Too Faced is an Estee Lauder brand, are still a heavy part of the brand identity to this day. Did you guys know that Too Faced created the first glitter eyeshadow? That's probably another thing I should have featured in today's video. I didn't even think about that. Too Faced is credited with creating the first, the very first glitter eyeshadow. One of their mantras is Too Faced is a serious brand that knows how to have fun. And you can see that in some of the names, you can see that in some of the overarching themes. Everything is always whimsical, very feminine, at a time where everything else was relatively very prestigious and bougie. Compared to other brands, Too Faced definitely grew relatively pretty quickly from launch up until where they are now. They launched in 98 and they were already in Sephora by the same year. So they launched in 98 and within two years, by 2000, they were already in Sephora. That's even difficult to do today, let alone back then. I mean, I don't know why I say this like this was 50 years ago, but you know, with the rise of social media and word of mouth, word of mouth hit different back in the 90s. Like you had to really work and entering into the cosmetic industry, like it's, you really had to like know somebody. By 2000, they started and opened their own standalone warehouse office. And I believe it's the same warehouse that they occupy today. It's crazy because on Too Faced's website, they credit 2005 
for the launch of shadow insurance and maybe jared thought i was asking about 2000s launches but i definitely asked him what was the tea about what y'all launched in the 90s? He said this was one of their first products. And he also credited lip injections as being one of their earlier, earlier 90s launches. We gonna get into that later. I'm pretty sure most of us know what an eyeshadow primer is, but basically the idea is if you are wearing a makeup product on your eyes, if you have oily eyelids, or otherwise just makeup that just doesn't stick and last long. The same way you would prime a wall before painting it, you would do the same thing with eyeshadow primer. Now eyeshadow primers in the 99s and the 2000s were massively popular. Like I don't remember a single, there was not a single eye tutorial, there was not a single eye tutorial that existed on YouTube and beyond without a mention of at least primer potion from Urban Decay or shadow insurance. It definitely paved the way. I definitely think it was one of the first of its kinds, if not the first of its kind and you know, proved to definitely be a major long standing stable for a lot of us in our makeup routines. What made shadow insurance so popular in my opinion was this was a time where the quality and the pigmentation of shadows at that time, like we thought we was doing something, but looking back, we most certainly were embarrassing ourselves. We were just a little bit, we were definitely, you know, okay, not all of us, not, some of us were doing something. Girl, eyeshadow quality back then was just like really, not it and so the best way to really get like the most color payoff longevity and wearability out of those products was by using like a shadow insurance it's supposed to help intensify the shadow color so like i mentioned earlier you know back when we just didn't really have as much access to products this was at a time where like mac was kind of the gold standard for pigment and shadows everything else it was like baby you better prime your eyes really well otherwise it's gonna slip right off or you're just not gonna see it one thing that i find really inspiring about jared and jeremy's story growth of two faces the fact that one they started together they're a husband and husband co-founders it's now an estee lauder brand but what's really interesting is that jared started at an estee lauder counter and then he eventually ended up selling his brand for a billy. I mean, like talk about a full circle moment, working behind the counter to then being cut a check from the same conglomerate you used to probably be working minimum wage for. That's kind of a big deal. Shadow insurance is still around today. You can still buy it today. And I've seen somewhat of a resurgence of it on TikTok. Michaela Nogueta still uses Too Faced shadow insurance in some of her tutorials. I actually use shadow insurance for this look today. And I have my use shadow insurance baby in a good like five years. I'm not gonna lie, like it definitely does still work as effective now as it did when you know I first discovered it when I first started my YouTube channel in 2009 it's pretty good do I think it's a need in a product no I mean nowadays you have concealer you have so many other staple in my opinion what we would consider staple eyeshadow priming techniques and methods you don't necessarily have to run to the store and get like a shadow primer back then yeah you definitely did like your looks were not gonna hit whereas like 10 years ago y'all i'm telling you there was like nothing to choose from oh makeup show what the hell has come a long way child so has the brand too faced went from mainly being in the eye category it is a full-fledged beauty brand and it has been for some time i had the pleasure of working with too faced in 2017 by expanding their born this way range of foundations still highly in my top five foundations that stuff is fire yes Yes, I'm gonna stick with item. We've had plenty of launches since then, but that foundation is fire. As for where Too Faced is today, the branding and the identity of Too Faced hasn't changed one bit. They pretty much always remain true to this playful, flirty, almost childlike branding, packaging identity. I also remember Too Faced being one of the bigger mainstream brands. I'm not saying they invented now, I'm not saying they invented, but I always remember Too Faced being one of the bigger brands to really blow up. Christmas for the beauty gurus. Just get the hell out of the way. If you don't got nothing to talk about for Christmas, then just scram. Even though they're now a part of the Estee Lauder portfolio, it's very interesting to see how much of the brand has changed. Remember how I told y'all earlier how we had that sponsor? Now's about that time. This portion of today's video is sponsored by Google Career Certificates. Grow with Google was created in 2017 to ensure that technology brings economic opportunities to everybody. Not everybody is cut from the same cloth. We don't always have access to the same opportunities as everyone else. Grow with Google recognizes that and brings free 
training, workshops, as well as digital tools for everyone. Wish I had something like this when I was younger. The purpose of these certificates is to give regular everyday people like me and you access to skills and knowledge that you can use in real life scenarios. These are certificates that are developed by Google and taught by Google. And then when you complete them, you have access to over 150 employers that are looking to hire people just like you. There is no experience required to enroll. These certificates are flexible and can be completed within six months. And you can also complete them at your own pace. I don't know any other way to make your resume more competitive than having a credential from Google. Yes, I'm baking, but pay attention, this part's important. You can visit grow.google slash certificates to explore Google career certificates and start learning today. A lot of people right now more than ever are making career changes. People don't want, you know, to go back to what they knew as their old life. I get it. I've I've experienced a career change of my own, so I get it. But I think right now, being able to access these resources that will put you in a better standing to find a new career field, and who knows, hopefully even put you on a path to a better, more in-demand job, why not go for it? And first and foremost, I'm Nigerian, so credentials to Nigerians are everything. You are out there trying to get back on your feet and you may not have the most money or access to other forms of education. I think this is a really great way to start, especially considering how everything right now is digital. The Google Career Certificate was quite literally created for people without a degree. And you're probably thinking, Jack, but how the hell is this gonna benefit me? Well, one, learning a skill is invaluable. Two, there are over 1.3 million available job openings across all certificates. 82% within six months, 82% of certificate graduates report some type of positive career impact. So it means they actually gain something from the certificate. Average entry level salary is 63,600 Zoolas. And these certificates have proven to be a really effective model for non-traditional creative fields. Thank you Google Career Certificates for sponsoring this portion of today's video. And while we're on the topic of chasing a bag, building a brand and following your career passions, let's get back to the video. And by the way, for my eyes, I'm using my Colored Rain Safari Palette. This is honestly like an OG staple for me. I stocked up on quite a few. It's still one of my favorites to date when I want like a more exotical, tropical, green eyeshadow look. Something that will go with the red hair. The next product that I bet you didn't know was birthed in the 90s is the ever so favorite of mine, the Estee Lauder Double Wear Foundation. This one was a shock to me. I definitely thought Nah, this is probably like a 2000s makeup product. But when I started doing some research, I was like, oh, this has been around longer than I realized. Estee Lauder is not only a makeup brand, it is now a conglomerate, which means they are a brand that buys and owns other brands. Too Faced, as we mentioned earlier, being one of those brands. Long before it became the giant that it is today, it was actually a family brand. It has very humble origins, same as most big brands where they are to start at home, they start making stuff in the kitchen, you know, remix. Estee Lauder, by the way, is a person. If you didn't know that Estee Lauder is a woman. The brand was founded and started by Estee and Joseph Lauder, a husband and wife duo. Ain't that romantic. You wanna prove how much you love me? How about you start a brand with me? How about you build an empire for me, Joseph baby? Essay definitely took on more of the creative role. She would give free makeovers. She led the creativity behind the brand, the product development behind the brand, and she was basically the face of the brand. And this is in 1946, y'all, so some of these brands have a 100 year head start. And I also think it's worth noting, I know we're gonna get into this a little bit later in the video, but that, what we call head start with family lineages and stuff like that. It's just so crazy how much inequality in the US plays into the difference between having an inheritance, having money that you've gotten from your family versus quite literally having nothing to build from. They call that the American dream, but, but even when it comes to the American dream, you can't really start from nothing. And when I say start from nothing, no, she might not have had a lot of money, but you know, she had her looks. She fit a particular beauty standard. And because of that, they've been able to build a family lineage that has now fed people from generations to generations to generations. It was just interesting to look at some of the brands as I was researching them and how they've been able to build legacies and generational wealth. And that's something that a lot of us are just unfortunately not afforded. Just something to think about. Not everybody had the same opportunities back then, but it is definitely inspiring, especially as a woman. You know, this is back in the day where like, women were not taken seriously in the 40s and 50s. And makeup, <sighs> makeup in the 40s? Girl, if you were wearing heavy makeup, like where were you going? And who were you going with? You know what I'm saying? They started the brand by launching with cold creams, 
They also pioneered the concept of gift of purchase. Now, if you don't know what gift of purchase is, when you go to a department store, you spend a certain amount. And this is something that's still really, really popular, mainly in department stores, but you spend a certain amount and you get like a free gift. It could be like a fragrance. It could be like a sample of something. It could be like a mini makeup bag. It could be a bunch of different things. But anyway, Estee Lauder was one of the earlier big brands to pioneer that concept and use that as like a, a selling point for it was largely as popular as it is today. And now literally all of the department, and now literally all the department store brands be doing them gift food purchases, which in my opinion are not that great, but you didn't hear that from me. Miss Essay was busy, honey. She was giving out these in-person makeovers. She was just truly building this brand by getting out there and charming people in person. She would offer things like free samples and like literally personally hand them out to customers. Like, wow, talk about personal service. And some of y'all at these hair salons won't even see us unless our hair is washed, pressed, blow dried chemically processed. Some of us could take some notes from Miss Lauder. I mean, she really added a very personable touch to the brand very early on. Girl, I don't know what they was thinking, but back then for whatever reason, it was just like really taboo for women to buy their own perfume. So your man would have to buy it for you or you would just have to stank, I guess. I don't know. But Miss Lauder? She says somebody ain't doing the math right. She knew that she couldn't launch a perfume for women because perfume was highly popular at the time, especially for women, but she knew that she couldn't launch a perfume for women because it was taboo. So what's the next best thing? Since I can't sell perfume, I'm gonna hit y'all with this bath oil that has fragrance in it. Wink. And you know, you can get your fix in another way. This was smart and I'm not mad at Ms. Lauder. A lot of things about our history, especially involving women, that don't really add up. So when this bath oil launched, it was the first women's perfume. We now know it as Youth Do. And this product is actually still available today. This stuff went crazy. It was selling like crazy, catapulted them into mega success. It was the first time women could buy their own perfume instead of having to wait until it was gifted to you. That just don't make no damn sense. After the launch of Youth Do, this is what really catapulted Estee Lauder, the brand, into a multi-million dollar company. By the 60s, they were selling overseas. They launched their first makeup collection in 1962. They also launched men's fragrance in the 60s. Y'all ever heard of Aramis? Yep, launched in the 60s. Their first men's fine fragrance. While Estee Lauder slowly becomes a global brand, this is around the time they start buying other brands. Fun fact, or maybe a little bit weird, Andy Warhol was a huge fan of Estee Lauder and when he died, rest in peace, he was buried with a bottle of beautiful perfume. Mm, it's kind of weird, but I'm not gonna lie, I'd probably do the same thing. Andy, I feel you. So by the 90s, Estee Lauder is pretty much huge. I mean, they're acquiring brands left and right. They bring MAC under their belt. They bring Joe Malone under their belt. They bring La Mer under their belt. I actually did not know La Mer was an Estee brand, but it makes sense. I mean, they, they are a big global brand, so Estee Lauder literally owns everything. I'm also pointing out that Double Wear is not just the name of the foundation. Double Wear is an entire collection that Estee Lauder carries. What a lot of makeup brands like to do and I honestly as a consumer I think this makes shopping for makeup genius if I know that I'm gonna like the born this way foundation and then you come out with a born this way concealer I'm already associating a particular formula finish performance with the foundation so if you launch a concealer under that same name I'm gonna assume okay if I like product X I'll probably like product B I know that does not always necessarily mean they all go hand in hand but double wear kind of does the same thing they have a double wear max coverage they have a double wear concealer and I'm about to wear double wear right now. They have an entire double wear line built out and it was supposed to be designed as a 24 hour stay in place makeup that doesn't budge, has full coverage. Double wear is not just the foundation, it's an entire line. They have double wear concealer, they have double wear a maximum uh, foundation, they also have a double wear pressed powder. So it's an entire line, the properties are supposed to be kind of like that same double wear quality. And double wear is definitely a full high glam foundation for somebody who just likes to really lay it on. They don't mince words when they say stay in place makeup. It absolutely does stay in place. This makeup does not budge for me and I have oily combination skins. Once that bad boy's on, she owns. She ain't going nowhere. Double Wear Today is also one of the foundation products on the market now that has one of the widest shade ranges. They have 54 shades in this foundation. I know they didn't launch a 54 shades, but as it stands now, that's quite, that's quite a lot of shades. You gotta be quick with it though. <laughs> she do settle, she settles really quickly. One of my favorite things about Double Wear is the fact that you don't really need to set it with powder. You can if you want to, but like once you put it on, it just kind of stays. It doesn't really move around. It's not oil slick. In my opinion, it is a self-setting liquid foundation. By the way, I'm using my 
Lashless Beauty Cream Blush. Love this stuff. I know I told y'all that Estee Lauder was a person, and she is, but she wasn't born Estee Lauder. She was actually born Josephine Esther Minster. Her parents were Hungarian Jewish immigrants, and she was raised in New York. Her mama was supposed to name her Estee, decided not to for whatever reason. Later on, Estee became more like a childhood nickname. Growing up, Estee had to work to make ends meet. She was meant to go right into the family business. Her father would have had her doing retail, but it wasn't until she started working with her uncle, he would teach her facial massages. He would teach her how to make beauty products like the cold cream that she invented. He taught her how to make body products. He taught her how to get facial massages. She was really inspired by that. That's ultimately what catapulted her into launching the Estee Lauder brand. I thought that that was worthy to note that although felt like this was worth noting because as we go through life, trying to figure out what the hell we gonna do or what the hell we not gonna do, it's really never too late to find yourself. It's never too late to change careers. It's never too late to be inspired by somebody later on in life. Jared with Too Faced, Estee Lauder with Estee Lauder. One thing that they have in common is they turn their passions into actual full-fledged careers. The next product that I wanna feature, one of the first ever beauty products that I ever tried before YouTube, before tutorial for all that stuff. My earliest memories of makeup are seeing my mom wear it. And she was not a glam girl. She didn't really wear foundation. She Definitely did not wear blush, but she always wore mascara and she always wore lipstick. Growing up, we were mascara snobs because you know, we have the lashes, it runs in our family. And one of the first mascaras I ever tried was Maybelline Great Lash. Learning about the history of Maybelline was quite interesting. First of all, I knew that the name Maybelline came from the word Mabel, but I didn't know Maybelline was started by a man. I'm not hating. Maybe a little bit I am. Men rule everything, but we gonna get, that, that's a different topic for a different day, okay? So Tom Lyle Williams, this is not the last, what wand is, no. Did they just change the wand? I don't know what that was. Okay, this is the wand that I was looking for. Maybelline as we know her today is pretty much the authority of mascara. But did you know back in the day, mascara was kind of at one point a no-no. And I'm gonna tell you why. So Maybelline was started. There's this guy, his name's Tom Lyle Williams. He's living in Chicago. This is back in like 1912. He's in his teens, 18. He starts seeing, oh, the girls are buying makeup from these little mail order catalogs. I need to get into this. This stuff is flying off of shelves. We need to get into this. So he flies his sister into Chicago where he lived at the time. He wants to get her involved so that they can start getting a chunk of the makeup pie. Now at this time it was not called mascara. This is early 1900s, okay? His first product was not actually called mascara because mascara was not really coined until years later. The first product was called Lash Browing, okay? Hella random. It was like in a tin and then you'd have to like brush it on. I have never felt more grateful for my mascara wands, honey. I'm so sorry to y'all. I mean, I'm sure they got lots of precision but damn, that was been a lot of work. The first ever batch that he made, the sister was the test dummy. And his sister's name was Mabel, by the way. She put it in her eyes and she's like, this ain't gonna work. Her eyes were burning. Not a cute situation at all. This is not ready to go to market. It's 1917, they end up perfecting this formula. Eventually they end up getting it right. Advertised as a cake lash beautifier, it goes to market. But remember, it was originally called Lash Browween. Yeah, there was one little problem with that name. The problem with that name is it was a conflict because another company owned that same name and they said, honey, it's time to pay up. A legal battle ensued, Maybelline lost. The Maybelline that we know and love today became that way literally because of the legal battle of Lash Browing. He was trying to trademark the name and that's when it came up. It's also very fascinating to realize how long things like trademarks have existed. Like who even think, it's just, it's crazy. But anyway, <laughs> that's when it became a conflict. So then he was like, all right, we gotta use something else. That's how Maybelline, the name of the brand was birthed. By the 1920s, the business was doing really well. Like it started growing. They started expanding their office spaces. They started buying buildings. They started also cementing themselves as the authority in other color category products. They launched eyeshadows, really kind of, you know, solidifying themselves as more than just mascara. But mascara has and always, in my opinion, will be the heartbeat of Maybelline products. But at the time, they were trying to expand. They're like, we got other heat too. We got other heat too. Now the 20s was booming. The 30s though, not so much. 
you did not want to be in the high business in the 30s. Uh, we think of the 20s, you think of flappers, you think of the film industry. These are two things that actually kind of made eye makeup and mascara products look bad because like for some odd reason, eye makeup was perceived as like immorality or something like that. And then to make matters worse, shout out to the FDA girl because back then they was definitely not regulating their products. 1933 and 1934, a lot of women started coming forward saying, hey, this contact dermatitis was not there before I started using this stuff, so what's tea? Some people were reportedly going blind from using these eye makeup products that were literally they were putting anything in this stuff petroleum dyes stuff that was obviously not safe for the eyes this was known as the lash lore scare or the lash lore incident which basically kind of pioneered how we regulate safety in cosmetics today that was when maybelline started taking a dip and they had to like re-strategize they had to come up with a bunch of other products learning about the lash lore incident definitely made me grateful of how much transparency we now have in beauty products because back then they didn't have that. A lot of those people were like the guinea pigs to the products, the safer and more accessible products that we have today. Shout out to y'all. Could not be me though. What I also found interesting is that Mr. Williams had a death grip on Maybelline up until he was like 70. He did not sell the brand until he was well into his 70s. That was when he was like, all right, I'm ready to kick my feet up and sell. A brand that he started in his teens goes on to be worth millions of dollars. He didn't step aside and sell the brand well into, he was like pretty much ready to, you know, night night. That's a lot of control. Great Lash was actually invented in 1971, but the reason why I chose it for this video is because I really truly feel like this mascara in particular, when you think of the 90s, they pretty much go hand in hand. Like it's so synonymous with a lot of 90s beauty trends. What I like about this mascara is one, the price point. Growing up, I obviously could not afford high-end cosmetics. Mascara was something that was simple yet effective. This mascara is like what, less than $10? I don't remember how much I paid for this, but it's, I wanna say like seven, five, seven dollars, something in that price range. They have a bunch of different colors. It comes in a brown, it comes in a regular black, a blackest black, a brown black. It's just variety. This is a really good mascara also for lengthening. Volume and lengthening for sure is the mascara that I would go to. But for volume and lengthening, Great Lash is definitely the mascara that I'm going to. I think the decade of perfecting and really solidifying themselves as the authority on eye makeup and mascara definitely shows when they launched Great Lash. I actually started using Great Lash Clear before I got into the actual Great Lash mascara. Way, way, way back in the day. Cause girl, I had to walk before I run now. Another product invented in the 90s, I think I mentioned this earlier, is the very famous Too Faced Lip Injections. The doo Lip Venom is technically the world's first lip plumper. Lip injections is known as the first efficacious lip pumper. Don't ask me what that means, I don't know what I mean. Of something inanimate or abstract, successful in producing a desired or intended result, effective. What I will say is this stuff really works. So put it on, sit back and, and wait. It literally feels like needles poking inside your lips. Once the blood starts flowing, you know it's pumping. It's easier to tolerate like when you have something else on top of it. Oh my God, it itches. <sighs> It's not painful, I swear. I know you're probably thinking, you're black. Why are you wearing lip plumper? Because why not? Why not? I love lip plumper. I actually love lip plumper like first thing in the morning, like after my skincare routine. I just like to put it on. And you know how like when your skin is a little bit puffier in the morning? It's just something about doing it after like a fresh face wash that I just feel like it just works better. Now the last makeup brand that I'm gonna talk about, I feel like kind of hits close to home. It's the brand that I worked for when I started my YouTube channel in 2009. It's a brand that a lot of you guys have at some point probably worked for, wanted to work for, or still work for it today. MAC Cosmetics. Chestnut lip liner to be specific. Excuse me, Pacific. Did y'all know this was Aaliyah's favorite lip liner? This was her staple lip pencil color. Chestnut liner I think is every brown girl's first mega product, arguably, next to gloss, but it's pretty high up there. It's a dark brown, burgundy undertone. Chestnut was definitely one of the first lip pencils that worked for my complexion. It's good with nudes, it's good with pinks, it's good with pretty much, it's a way to make any lip color blend in with your natural complexion. I feel like deep down, I'll kind of always be a matte girl. I didn't have the best experience 
working for Mac, but I also didn't have the worst. You know, it's kind of bittersweet. But a lot of the products, including Chestnut Liner, really helped shape and solidify the beauty aesthetic that I still follow today. Makeup Art Cosmetics was started in Canada. It was a Canadian brand. Frank Toskin and Frank Angelo, yes, they have the same name. One was a photographer, one was a makeup artist. At the time, makeup was terrible. This was the 90s, remember. Ooh, not these eyes doing. Hey, I did something. Y'all remember what makeup in the 90s looked like, especially complexion products. They were bad. So Franks Squared recognized this and they were like, we need to do something. What better way to be the first to kind of pioneer that than the person who's looking at it in pictures? You know, it makes sense. This was around the time that AIDS and HIV was still so massively stigmatized, wasn't a lot of research, wasn't a lot of support, and it was really affecting the beauty and the fashion community, mainly people of color a lot. And they knew this because they saw it, they worked with creatives, they worked with designers, stylists, models, makeup artists, they were seeing who it was affecting and they were like, okay, we gotta do something. Oh, this liner will never not be a thing. It's been a while since I've used this liner because I've gone on to use other things, but it's still bomb. So in 1994, recognizing how hugely AIDS and HIV needed all the help that it can get, they created the MAC AIDS Fund, which was a built-in charity where people could purchase products and it would go to help provide funding and donations for AIDS and HIV research. Now they recognized that lip products are the easiest tie-in for this fund because one, lip, word of mouth, talking, it's the, most, it's the first thing you see on the face. So they decided to create a specific line, 100% of the proceeds, no matter what, goes straight towards the MAC AIDS Fund. And that is known as Viva Glam. That's literally why Viva Glam was created. A lot of you guys probably already know this, but I'm just, just giving you backstory, okay? Now, Viva Glam also is a product on my list because it was, again, birthed in the 90s, popularized in the 90s. But I feel like Viva Glam also needed recognition in my video. One, because of all that it's provided for AIDS and HIV research. Up to date, it's estimated, this could be give or take a couple million off, but up to date, they've raised up to $400 million towards HIV and AIDS research, which is huge. Every single time you buy a Viva Glam lipstick, you know exactly where and what your money is going towards. And that's why when I worked for MAC, it was something that we always kind of like pushed as a passion because you don't earn anything from, from Viva Glam. MAC don't earn nothing from Viva Glam sales. We don't earn nothing from Viva Glam sales. And that's why they've been able to raise so much in the time frame of its existence. So one thing that I think is important to note also about Viva Glam is it really kind of like popularized and sort of pioneered like early celebrity beauty collabs. Back then, this was when the first ever Viva Glam spokesperson was RuPaul. And this was way, way, way before drag was like mainstream and drag was cool. RuPaul was the first face of a Viva Glam collab. They also went on to collaborate with Mary J. Blige and Lil' Kim. That one was actually one of my favorite campaigns for MAC, period. Not just Viva Glam, but period. And the thing about these collabs is the artist that they're collabing with gets to pick their own shade. It's a collab in the truest sense of the word. I also really like the collab that they did with Nicki. And I love when artists stick to timeless colors reds, pinks. It's like they're always kind of sort of in the same color family, but the first Viva Glam lipstick was actually a bright blue. Fun fact, according to MAC's website, they really got their big break when Madonna wore the lipstick and then it just took off from there. MAC, hands down to me, still makes some of the best lip products for formula, shade range. I mean, I don't know any, I can't think of any other brand that regularly carries that wide of a category of lip products permanently. Like they have a lip color for everything and I don't have to wait for a season to see a certain color. I don't always love the collections and it can be annoying. And I do think that over time, Mac, what used to be known as a brand that really is at the forefront of trends and what's relevant and what's for the culture, they've kind of taken a step back a little bit. But I think just for, their legacy, like it's Mac, like they're timeless. They're not, to my knowledge, I don't think they're going anywhere. And they may not be doing what they used to do in terms of relevancy, but they're definitely a pioneer and Viva Glam solidifies that for me. This lip is a Mac lip. I don't, I don't know why I ever stopped using Chestnut because now I'm going right back to where I started. The next product is not makeup but it is a beauty category. And for the culture, I had to include a perfume. Terry Mugler Angel 
birthed in the 90s, still very much relevant today. Mugler Angel is known as the first gourmand category perfume that we know today. It was literally one single note that created the entire gourmand category. That note is called Maltol. It comes from like large bark or something, I don't know. The first time I smelled Angel, I did not think sweet at all. I thought more sort of spicy, sort of woodsy, but at the time when it was created, it was way sweeter and more sugary than anything else that was on the market or had ever been invented up until that point. Everything else was either richly floral or something else. Uh, gourmand category fragrances are actually my favorites. So the fact that we have Angel to thank for that entire category today makes me very grateful. So I bought it. It's not my favorite. It's truthfully not one of my favorite perfumes, but I do have it because I think it's a classic. I think it's something that every perfume lover should wear. Like every perfume lover should at least have like the first, you know? I definitely am gonna eventually track down Youth Do, which I had mentioned earlier. You can still buy it today from Estee Lauder, which is another big pioneer for fragrance as we know it today, for women especially. And yeah, if you don't know what gourmands mean, it basically means anything that has like a foodie, sugary, sweet, chocolate, vanilla, caramel, anything kind of milky in scent and in flavor, because you know, taste buds, scent notes, they're related. Those are pretty much all the products that were birthed in the 90s and popularized today. Thank you again. I wanna also shout out again, Laura Jane Atelier. If you guys like vintage videos and vintage YouTubers, I'm telling you, her channel is so cute. She doesn't just talk about makeup, she also talks about history and just like really cool vintage topics, things that I never knew. And a lot of the things that she talks about are still relevant and are going on today in a really messed up way. It's kind of annoying. Thank you again to Google Career Certificates for sponsoring today's video. The link to how to get started will be down in the description box. And while you're down there, bookmark that page and then watch another video. Because why wouldn't you? I'm just, it's a no brainer, I'm just saying, why wouldn't you?